Friends, as we anticipate the arrival of more worshipers, I invite you to scooch. And scooching means moving yourself a little closer to the center of the pew that you're in, and that will make it much easier for those who are arriving now uh, to find their way into the pew as well. Let's get friendly and familiar this morning. Thank you. 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and you have come. Whatever it is that has led you to this space on this Easter Sunday morning, you have come. Whatever it was that threatened to hold you back, you have left it behind. Whatever it is you most need this day, you can find it here. Because Christ is risen. Because love wins. Because hope endures. Because joy is possible. Christ is risen indeed. And so all of you, first-time guests, out-of-town visitors, long-time members, family and friends, you who are here often and you who have not been for a long, long time, you are welcome here today. We know that there are many guests with us in worship to celebrate Easter, and we are thrilled that you are here. We'd love the chance to share more with you about the life of Second Presbyterian Church and would encourage you to leave contact information either on the welcome books or using the QR code you'll find on your bulletin. Second is an active and lively congregation. There is literally something for everyone here, and we would love to help you get involved. This day, together, we are united by the power and promise of resurrection that Christ is risen. Let us prepare our hearts to meet him with praise. Children of God, welcome home. Please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. The tomb is empty, Christ is risen. The soldiers have returned home, Christ is risen. The anger of the crowds is gone, Christ is risen. The time of grieving has ended, Christ is risen. Violence, fear, and death have been defeated, Christ is risen, come. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us pray. O oh God, three days ago, we were your Good Friday people, lost in confusion, running from the truth, accusing, betraying, denying, grieving at the foot of the cross. Today, we are your Easter people, longing to feel in our bones the hope of resurrection. Christ is risen, risen indeed. And as you have raised him to new life, surely you will raise us. It is our hope, O oh God, both ancient and always new. And we thank you for creating us, for redeeming us, for sustaining us, for showing us your power through love. It is in Christ's name that we trust and pray. And the people of God said, Amen.
please be seated. <clears throat> Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, if we name all that we have done and left undone, all that grows the chasm between us, then God forgives our sin and sets us free to do the work of repair, to walk ever more fully in the light, to practice resurrection. And so in humility and with faith, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. God of new life, we confess how human we are. We haven't done any great evil, but we have failed to do good when we have the chance. We have not intentionally hurt anyone, nor have we offered healing to the broken. We easily accept the witness of the angel in the tomb, but find it difficult to share this good news with our friends and neighbors. Bring us new life, God of grace. When we are tired and stressed, give us the energy to serve you. Transform our hardened hearts into fountains of grace. Forgive us for the damage we have done and fill us with the joy of your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, who gives us life, we pray. Oh, friends, hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. As the psalmist says, it is new every morning. It is new this Easter morning. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. So may we be at peace and free to love ourselves and one another as God in Christ loves us. Alleluia. Amen. bind us together and create new possibilities for our relationships here in this room, in our homes, in our communities, in our world. 
as God has made peace with us, we can make peace with one another. So let's greet each other this morning, sharing our names and our handshakes and our fist bumps, passing the peace won through the cross of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. Seated, and I would love for all my young friends in the sanctuary to join me here on the chancel steps.
Good morning, friends. We're going to give the rest of our friends just a minute to get up here because some of them are traveling from a long distance. <laughs> Very good. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Thank you. Or as we say here in the sanctuary, we say, I say, Christ is risen, and you say, He is risen indeed. Let's try that one. Christ is risen. Very good. And you know the story that we are going to tell today, it's the story that's the story, right? It's the story. It's the Easter story. And at the start of the Easter story, a group of women are surprised. So you know my first question for you this morning. Raise your hand if you've ever been surprised. Anybody ever been surprised? Okay, some of us have been surprised. When you are surprised, what does your face look like? Let me see your surprised face. Yeah, that's a good one. (laughs) Do you want to see mine? Here's my surprised face. You ready? Okay, here we go. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. The surprise on Easter morning is that these women come to a tomb, which is where you expect a, a body to be, but there's no body there. And whose body are they looking for? Jesus, but it's not there, and so they are surprised, and I wish we had pictures or videos of their faces when they walked in and there was no body in that tomb. I bet they were surprised. Now, earlier in the service, we said some words that are Easter words, and those words are words like, Jesus is risen, Jesus is alive, and then we say, Jesus is with us. And that's the one I'm wondering about, that last one. Jesus is with us. How many of you have done an Easter egg hunt before? Raise your hand if you've done an Easter egg hunt. What I think we ought to do this morning is go on a little bit of a Jesus hunt. And so I'm going to see, uh, is he over here or something? No, he's not over there. Where, where, is, where is Jesus? Anybody know? Is he? No, no. Where, where is Jesus? I know. Oh, yeah, he's up there. That's true. He's... <laughs> He's up there. (laughs) Say that out loud. He's everywhere. That's right. Where do you think Jesus is? Everywhere. Everywhere. That's right. Yes. In our hearts. hearts. That's absolutely right. You got it. Yes. Anywhere we go. go. Correct. Yes. In In heaven. That's right. Jesus is there too. So I'm going to tell you some really good news that you already know because you've just told me that good news, and it's Jesus is with us wherever we go. That's what Easter means, that Jesus is with us in our house and at our school, and when we go on a trip and when we're playing on the playground and when we go to the park and when we're at a restaurant and when we come to church, Jesus is with us because Easter says Jesus is alive. And there's one other piece of that that I want you to remember. That means if Jesus is with us, we're never alone. And I know sometimes I feel alone, and it really helps me to remember that Jesus is with me. So that's my Easter word. Jesus is with us. We never need to feel alone. So we're going to say a prayer together, and first we're going to have our hands out, and then I'm going to count to three, and we're going to do a big prayer clap on three, and then you're just going to repeat the prayer after me. Are you ready? One, two, three. (laughs) Dear God, God, help me see what you see. Help me me love the way you love. love. In In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter, everybody, and you can go right back to your pews with your families or the folks you came with. Let us turn to God in prayer. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, 
we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. May God bless the reading and hearing of Scripture. At the center of our faith, there is a story. Without that story, our faith is in vain. This is that story. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. 
They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him, but go, tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. I wonder if you have ever returned to a place you once knew well, only to discover that everything had changed. The house where you once scribbled on the walls has been painted a different color. The tree from whose sturdy branches you once swung has been chopped down. Someone else's car sits in the driveway where you learned to drive. The best coffee shop in town is now a Chick-fil-A. The Little League fields are townhouses. And of course, you have changed too. You've grown up, you've moved out, you've moved on. I remember, I remember walking into the gym where decades earlier I had spent my glory days as a basketball player. When were my glory days? Thank you for asking. <laughs> Fifth grade. I wore number 12 for my hero, John Stockton. And my assist to turnover ratio that year was off the charts. <laughs> now, in my memory, in my mind's eye, the gym at, at the elementary school in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, is Madison Square Garden. It's filled to the rafters with screaming fans, and all of their eyes are on that star point guard for Vandalia Presbyterian Church Pee Wee Boys Team. Why do they call it Pee Wee? <laughs> now, perhaps the picture feels like a bit much, but then again, you weren't there. You don't know how it felt. Well, I regret to inform you upon further investigation, it turns out that the arena in my mind is in fact a dusty, dark, aging school gymnasium. The day I made my triumphant return, that space was filled not with cheering fans to greet my arrival, but with kindergartners learning how to jump rope. I bet you've had a similar experience. Maybe the author Thomas Wolfe was right, you can't go home again. After all, so much has changed. Going back is unsettling. It's humbling. And yet we all do it. We do go back. We have reunions and homecomings. We take family trips to the places that hold our roots. We drag our children to small towns and hole-in-the-wall spots where our stories begin. There is this compulsion, this, this instinct, this human behavior that, that leads us back. 
There is the desire within us to return home, to remember where we've been. We go back not only to recall the good old days, but to retrieve a part of ourselves we left behind, a part of ourselves we ache to rediscover. Going home again can awaken us to who we are. Three women arrive at the tomb early on a Sunday morning. They find the stone rolled away and a mysterious young man in a white robe, an angel? Mark doesn't tell us. The messenger shocks the women by announcing that that Jesus, whom they are seeking, has been raised from the dead. Good news, but he is not here. He's already gone, gone away. Gone where? Galilee. Galilee? Galilee. I would not have gone to Galilee. (laughs) If God had resurrected me, I wouldn't even have gone to Disney World. Maybe Hawaii. But the message is clear. Jesus has gone to Galilee. And we must go there too. So where is Galilee? It is where the story of Jesus began. A small town, hole in the wall spots where he called his first followers by the lake shore. Where he healed disease where he extended hospitality to the stranger, where he made outsiders a part of his inner circle, where he spoke of a love so strong it could overcome death, where he promised a future in which God's dream for human flourishing would come true. You see, Galilee is home, and this is where they will see the resurrected Christ, You have to go home again. Friends, if we remain in the tomb too long, we will miss Jesus. Put another way, the most consequential part of faithful living is not coming to church on Easter Sunday, though we are certainly glad you did. But be warned... If you stay in the sanctuary too long, you will miss Jesus. He is already ahead of you, in front of you, gone home again. Yes, yes, Jesus has been raised from the dead, but he is not here. Go, tell the others, he is alive, he is is on the loose, he haunts the places you know the best, he resides in the sites where you spend your days, but not only that, he exists in the experiences of joy and grief, pain and pleasure, mountaintop and darkest valley, go home again, and there you will see him. And so they did. Filled with a dynamic mix of fear and amazement, terror and wonder, they went home again. Back to that ordinary dusty place where a young carpenter named Jesus had lived. They returned to the spot, the very spot where he had spoken their name out loud. Where, they, where he had seen something in them they could not see in themselves. And there they remembered. They recalled how that man had looked them in the eye and said, follow me. And so they do. They follow him home again, and that, that is where they see it. That is where they see him. That is where they remember who they are. 
where they find their voices to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus and start a movement that will take over the world with God's love. Mark's gospel includes no appearance of the risen Christ, not in its earliest versions. You see, the gospel writer Mark understood that it is a fool's errand to attempt to prove the resurrection or to convince anyone of what happened Instead, Mark tells us where we will find him. He urges us to open our eyes to resurrection all around us. Not in electrifyingly dramatic theatrical displays of divine power, but in glimpses in moments, in the ordinary, in Galilee. And when you believe it, you see it. And when you see it, then you know, then you know. And so the summons of Easter is to go back to Galilee. The summons of Easter is to go home again and see the place for what it truly is. Illumined by God's love, overflowing with possibility, alive with resurrection, the summons of Easter is to be alert to glimpses of grace in every direction. The summons of Easter is never to explain, but always to see, to know, to tell. And so I have to tell you what I heard and saw on Tuesday afternoon. Over lunch, a small group of friends was studying Scripture and sharing stories as we do every month. One member of the group reflected that afternoon on the rawness of grief following the death of his son, far too young, just before Christmas. He used powerful words to describe that grief, words like astonishing and breathtaking, a constant hollow aching for what has been lost. And then he shared something unexpected something filled with beauty, something equally breathtaking. He described how his son, a man of deep faith, was a lover and avid observer of nature. He told a story that not long after his death, his wife was walking in the woods when a red-tailed hawk landed on the trail just in front of her. It sat on the ground, staring up at her, and she knew. She saw and she knew. She knew and she smiled. She smiled and she said out loud, I'm okay. I'm okay. Since that day, the family's group text has been filled with stories of similar encounters. The family has seen red-tailed hawks everywhere, in ridiculous places, swooping overhead as his daughter drove up the East Coast, showing up on a family trip to Japan, landing on the fairway of a golf course, the window frame of a restaurant, regular appearances in the woods around his parents' home, always staring, always looking, always stopping long enough. I'm okay. I'm okay. As our friend shared that story, we were all deeply moved. We discussed how God shows up whenever we need assurance the most. To offer glimpses of a promise kept. Holy moments of encounter.
The lunch ended and we went our separate ways. 90 minutes later, I got in my car to deliver an Easter lily and prayer shawl to that family. They weren't home that afternoon, and so I put the flower and shawl on the porch and headed out. They have a long and winding driveway, and when I came to the street, I pulled out my phone to check directions to make sure I was headed the right way back to the church, and as I did, the hair on my arms stood up on end, and I looked up, and that's when I saw it, the red-tailed hawk resting on the power line just above me staring straight down at me. Two minutes passed. The hawk opened its wings and lifted off. And I knew. I just knew. I knew I had been given a glimpse and I could not wait to get into this pulpit and share it with you on this Easter Sunday. I will make no attempt to explain it. I'm not going to try. I could not if I tried, but this is what I know. Hear this gospel truth. Life, your life has an eternal significance, a weight beyond all human measure. Your life matters because God says so. Yes, it does. The world, this world, is filled with a power that we cannot comprehend. A goodness that sits at the center of reality. Here is what I cannot prove and know to the core of my being, that love will have the final word in this world. Yes, it will. Yes, Jesus Christ is risen, but he is not here. He's ahead of you. Gone home again. So get going. Find your courage. Lift your eyes and open your hearts. Follow him. You will see him. And you will know. Tell the others. Amen. In worship, we have the opportunity to tell the others, to respond to the ways that God is speaking to us, not to explain, but like a road map guiding us home, we affirm our faith together. So I invite you to stand in body or in spirit so we can say together the words printed in your bulletins. What do we know to be true? This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. If we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. 
God, this is your good news. It confounds and amazes us. So help us not to limit it by our constrained imaginations. Open each of us this day, skeptics and seekers, doubters and dogmatists, to hear your gentle invitation to come and see, to be welcomed home again, where you wait expectantly, like a loving parent, always ready to scoop us up and send us out. Yes, this is your good news. For Jesus Christ is risen from the dead so that morning after morning we might rise to love bigger than the day before, to serve more freely than once seemed plausible, and to welcome all your world the way you welcome us. We are here today because your world needs good news. So we hold the hurting and the heartbroken before you and we plead for resurrection to burst forth. God, we pray for those places in our world where wheat fields and food lines have turned into tombs. From Gaza to Ukraine to Myanmar, no place is outside your loving gaze. Weep with us and then work with us to make our ways of living with one another good news too. God, surrounded by lilies given for those whom we love and have lost, we pray for those sitting alongside us whose hearts are heavy, who on a day full of fanfare and trumpets feel a clanging hollowness, those who showed up here heartbroken from the diagnosis, the death, the lost job, the failed test, the broken relationship, the mental illness or missed opportunity, the plans that have gone unrealized, and the hurts we're too famished to forgive. God, when we peer into the tombs of our own lives, we recognize with the terrified feeling of the women, what could this mean? Could Jesus be alive in the midst of this? Grant us, your people, the courage to journey alongside those who stand at the doors of tombs, not with answers or cheap explanations, but accompanying one another into the questions, not letting up until we see the wounds of your world join to the wounds of Christ. And perhaps that is your good news. Our wounds have found their home in you. And there is hope, even here, for new life. So we rest our prayers into Jesus' scarred and sensitive hands, asking that you'll help us to rise with Christ to be good news. As we raise our vo voices together with the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the risen Lord Jesus invites us into a new way of life, a way of life where fear is replaced by fortitude, selfishness by sacrificial love. With full knowledge of our strengths and weaknesses, the risen one stands with us, calling each of us by name, calling us to follow him. Jesus calls us to share our strengths and our gifts Moreover, Jesus calls us forth in our weakness, for we follow the one who served and suffered in weakness and is therefore highly exalted above every name on earth and in heaven. Consider today where Jesus may be calling you to follow him, heart and mind, soul and strength. We invite you to be renewed by Christ here at second through service, through study, through 
sacrificial giving. And to that end, let us worship God now with God's tithes and our offerings.
Lord of life, we offer you these gifts and indeed our whole lives, heart and soul, mind and strength, for all things belong to you. We are but stewards entrusted with talents and treasures for the purpose of witnessing to the great love you've shown for the world through our crucified and risen Savior. May all that we have and indeed all that we are bear witness to reflect the light of your love seen clearly in your word made flesh in whose name we pray. Amen. Yes, Jesus Christ is risen indeed, but he is not here. He is already ahead of you. He calls as he did those first disciples, follow me. And if you do, you will see him. In the places you live and work and play and pray, you will see him. And you will know. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain with each of you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.